the matter we'll be speaking about today is the matter of the Ariya Satcha, the Noble Truths. But before we discuss them, we'd like to develop some understanding about certain things. In particular, about we ought to understand what is meant by Buddhism. This suffix ism, if it means a certain viewpoint or a certain set of opinions or theories, if it means that kind of thing rather than direct realization, direct spiritual experience, then that kind of ism isn't really what is meant or isn't really fitting with, with Buddhism. That's not what we mean when we use the word Buddhism. Forgive us for saying so, but actually this word Buddhism is one that the Westerners came up with on their own and applied it. And it probably isn't really the right word anyway, since they probably didn't know what they were talking about. And so this ism of Buddhism, does it, does it mean truth? As far as we can tell, ism doesn't really have much to do with truth. It's just one point of view, one body of opinions that a certain group of people put forward and say this is what we believe in. But that's, that's not what we're concerned with here. And then there's a word that the Thais came up with themselves. Or the word, the Thai pronunciation is Puta Sasana, or in English it reads Buddha Sasana. This word Buddha Sasana, unfortunately, generally has a meaning and connotations that are too heavily leaning towards study, towards what's written down in the books, and those kind of things. And so this word isn't really correct either. It doesn't really get to the, the proper meaning that we should be looking for. Then there's another word which to us seems to be most correct. It's a word we first used 45 years ago when we were invited for the first time to give lectures in Bangkok. It's the word Buddha Dhamma, Buddha Dhamma. This word Dhamma or Dharma in Sanskrit, Tam in the Thai translation pronunciation, has quite a, a broad, extensive and profound meaning. It can mean path just, or way, just as the word Tao from China, the word Tao that means path or way, or Dhamma can mean duty, and Dhamma can mean truth or satya. And if, since Dhamma has, includes all these meanings, then it's very appropriate. It's the most appropriate word to use for what is generally called Buddhism. So we suggest that to take as a principle for our study that we use the word Buddha Dhamma, the Buddha, the Buddha way, or the, the Buddha duty, the Buddha truth instead of these, these other words. We suggest the word Buddha Dhamma as the most appropriate 
name for what we're discussing. However, if we'd like to go back to the Buddha's time, we can use the word that the Buddha actually used himself, the word that came out of the Buddha's mouth directly, which wasn't any of these words Buddha Sasana or Buddhism or even Buddha Dhamma. The word the Buddha used himself to refer to his, the, his teaching and the way of life he, he was showing to people and the truth he was talking about, the truth he had discovered. He used for all of this the word Brahma Jariya, Brahma Jariya, the sub, sublime way of life the sublime spiritual life, the excellent spiritual life. Brahma means sublime, supreme, the highest, or it can mean excellent, even perfect. And jadiya means to, to behave, to act, to practice. But in this is the meaning, the important meaning of commitment. So we could call it the supreme commitment or the supreme way of living, the sublime way of life. This is what the Buddha called it, the Brahmajariya. And this is a word worth, worth our attention. And so therefore we will approach things as the Buddhist way of life when we discuss the noble truths we'll be looking at them from the we'll be looking at them as the buddhist way of life and then this this word the buddhist way of life is corresponds exactly with the noble eightfold path which is the the heart of buddhism in which we will discuss later. Because this is something we've never heard of before, it's necessary that we call it, we use the word new, and call it the new way of life, a new way of life. And so when it's all new, then the life that we discover is a new life. And so we'll stress this this point of new life. When we say new, it doesn't just mean strange or different. It means new in the sense that we've never seen it before, we've never heard of it before, we've never just come across this before. And so to us, it's, it's entirely new. But really, it's not new at all. It's, it's been around for so long that we can't even say it's old. So when we say new, it means it's new for us, new for those of us who are discovering it for the first time. And in this respect, the real meaning of new is to be above and beyond all influence of good and evil. This is what's gonna, this is what will be truly new for us, to be, be above, to be beyond good and evil. If we speak kind of philosophically, we can say that this is to be above all dualism, all duality. Or if we use the terminology of Taoism, then we could say to be above yin and above yang, meaning to be above the positive and above the negative. If we speak in Christian terms, especially as it's expressed in the very beginning of the Christian Bible, then we say to be above good and above 
evil. In Buddhism we can, we could accept all of these to be above all <coughs> pairs of opposites, all of those pairs, those dualisms, where good is opposed to evil, positive opposed to the negative, yin is opposed to yang. To be above all this is the meaning of the new life. You might want to, you might have noticed that in the Bible, there is no place in the New Testament that talks about being above good and evil. But there is a place in the Old Testament, in the very first chapters of Genesis, that talks about being, that talks about or discusses being above all good and all evil. So we don't know if, to, if we should say that this is a Christian teaching or the teaching before Christianity or whatever. But there's this very important truth revealed at the very beginning of the Bible. Living a life above all, all of the power of good and evil. So let's, let's use the, the term a new way of life. The new way of life. This is a very, this is a term that's accessible to everyone. It should be acceptable to, by all. If we use this, this approach, this term, the new way of life, then there doesn't have to be any con conflict, say, with our parents who maybe hold to a certain religion such as Christianity or Judaism. And if we, we come to, in order to understand the new way of life, then it's not necessary for us to convert or change our religion. If we follow a certain religion, that's fine. And we're just coming, we don't have to, to end that. We're just coming to, to get to the, the heart of the new way of life. This is something that all of us, all of us can do, finding this way of life that is beyond or above good and evil. Because then there's nothing that's, that when the mind or when we're above all the power of all good and evil, then nothing, nothing can shake the mind. Nothing, nothing bothers, nothing annoys the mind and then one is free, and then life is truly new. So let's talk about the new way of life. Those of us who come from the Judeo-Christian traditions, if through the new life <coughs> we, will, we will become truly Jewish or truly Christian, whichever it is we we follow by discovering the new life that is above the influence of good and evil, then this will per follow exactly the instruction that God gave to Adam and Eve at the beginning of the Bible, where God told Adam and Eve not to attach to good and evil. If one attaches, then one will die. So to be truly, to truly follow this, these instructions of God is to, to be a perfect Jew or a perfect Christian. And so this is done by discovering the new life. For those who are still stuck on the word religion, we should we should check what this word actually means. The old definition that we can find in the Latin roots of the word is the, the observation, the 
the observations, that means practices or way of living, that tie humanity to the highest thing. Now, for many, this means it ties, ties humanity to God. For many, the highest thing is taken to be God. But if we use the word religion in terms of the Buddha Dhamma, then we have to change, we have to understand that the highest thing is understood to be Nibbana. In Buddhism, the highest thing, the supreme thing is Nibbana or the Sanskrit pronunciation is Nirvana. So everything we've said so far has been said with the purpose of helping us to understand what is meant by the word Buddhism, or at least what ought to be understood by the word Buddhism. Really, we don't think this word is very appropriate. However, it's been used so much and so often and for so long that it's hard to avoid it. So at least if we use this word, because it's convenient, we'll have a proper understanding that Buddhism, when we say Buddhism, it means that way of life which unites humanity with the highest thing, which unites humanity, which unites the human being with Nibbana. And so, since we have to use the word Buddhism because it's, it's so common, we request that everybody understand it, its correct meaning. However, we can, all we can do is request this because we don't have any authority to, to demand that you do so. In Buddhism, there is no, no authority anywhere. Nobody has the right or the, the copyright or the legal power to insist or demand that things be a certain way. In Buddhism, all authority is with nature. There is no authority resting in any individual, organization, or church. The only authority is in nature. But we, and so, we just request for our mutual advantage and benefit that we understand the word Buddhism as we have been discussing it. In the words of the Buddha, who said, I, I merely point the way. You yourselves must walk the way. I mere, the Buddha said, I merely point the way. You must walk the way yourselves. This word, the way here, is very similar to the words of Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, I am the way. But this is generally understood in a way very different, or with a meaning different from the meaning the Buddha used in saying, I merely point the way, you must walk it yourself. But so we should be very careful to understand what is the me what is the meaning of the way that Christ was talking about. In Buddhism, the Buddha is not the way. The Buddhism or the Buddha Dhamma is the way. And the Buddha is the one who points that way out to us who haven't noticed it yet in order that we may walk it for ourselves. In all the theistic religions, it is said that the religion has been revealed to mankind by God. The religion is a revelation from God. But in Buddhism, we don't talk like that. In Buddhism, the Buddha Dhamma 
is something that has been discovered here in this world, has been discovered within nature, and then taught, explained, pointed out. And so there's this, this difference in the, the way the theistic religions and the way Buddhism speak. But really it's not a big deal. It's nothing to get excited about. The important matter is whether it can extinguish suffering or not. If, if it can get rid of suffering, if, if it can end suffering, then that's all that matters. Whether it comes from up above in, in the kingdom of God and then is revealed down here on earth, or whether it's discovered here within this natural life here on earth. Either way, if it, if it ends suffering, that's, then it's everything we need. So please don't waste any time arguing about where the truth comes from, whether it comes from God or we discover it for ourselves in nature. There's, there's no benefit at all arguing about such points. We should put all our attention, give all our interest and energy to, to discovering what the truth really is and then finding out, can this truth, can this truth end all suffering? How, how can this truth end suffering? It's not so important where the truth comes from but does, is it really the truth? If it's the truth, it will end all suffering. And so this is the point that deserves our attention. The other matters can be left aside. There's no need to get into arguments and conflicts over such, such unimportant things. And so all the perspectives or approaches about God, for now we can put those aside and we'll talk exclusively of the way in Buddhism or the way of Buddha Dhamma. This is the, the truth in the way of life that has been discovered within nature right here. And then after that discovery has been pointed out, explained, and taught throughout the years. And so we'll be talking about this, this, that which we can find for ourselves within nature, which brings us back once again to the word Dhamma. Dhamma means nature. It means the truth of nature, natural truth. And this is what we'd like to talk about we'd like to discuss the, the meaning of the word Dhamma a bit. Dhamma means, means nature or, or Dhamma Jati. Dhamma Jati, Jati means birth. So born in Dhamma or born through Dhamma, born of Dhamma. This is literally what is used to mean the word in English, nature. Nature, everything that is born out of Dhamma. This is what we mean by, by nature. So Dhamma means nature. But there's another word, Dhammada, or in Thai, Tamada, Dhammada, which means ordinary. It just means all these ordinary, regular things all over the place. It can even be used regarding people when certain aspects of character are so, so common or ordinary in a person that they become habitual. We say that this person is ordinarily angry or this person is ordinarily stingy or this person is ordinarily afraid, meaning they have this habit or this, this is their character. So. Tamada is just this, just means ordinary. Tamajati is natural. Really these words mean the same thing. There's a bit of a literal difference, 
or when we say natural, when we say ordinary, it means the same thing. And this is some of the meaning of the word Dhamma. The Dhamma, the word Dhamma is, is so broad and extensive it takes a while to, to study it thoroughly. And so we need to, to give it some time. We understand that the word normalcy is, fits the word tamada the best. That we can use the word normalcy on all levels. Normalcy on the lowest level to the highest level. This is what we've meant by tamada. This is an important meaning of dhamma. So we can, we can take the word dhamma-jati or nature as the meaning of dhamma. But it's, and this, this meaning of nature includes the meaning, the sense of normalcy. So nature and normalcy we can take as the meaning of dhamma. And then this, this nature is what we'll study further. Now, the English word nature probably doesn't fit exactly with the word dhamma chati, but we don't have any other word in English to use. And the word nature is close enough, it's good enough. And so we, we're forced to use the word nature. But when we use this, please understand that nature means includes everything. There aren't, there isn't a nor, an ordinary nature and then some supernature. In Buddhism, we don't use the word supernatural. There's, we don't see that there's really any such thing. Supernatural is just for the people who haven't understood all of nature and so they separate off the part that they don't understand and call it super. But in Buddhism, all of it is nature. Whether it's super or not super, it's all dhamma jati. So now that we, we understand that dhamma is nature, this, this word nature can be be viewed in four aspects or analyzed into four aspects. The first is nature itself. Then there is the law of nature. Within all nature we can find the law of nature. Then the third meaning is duty in accordance, duty in accordance with the law of nature. And fourth, the results of that duty. All four of these meanings, or all four of these sense, all four of these are just, are all part of or included in the word nature or Dhamma. If one understands all these aspects of nature, of Dhamma that we're discussing, then it will be quite simple to understand the the Noble Truths, the Ariya Satya. Nature, all things, all nature. This is one Noble Truth. And then the Truth of Nature is another Noble Truth that must be known, that must be understood. And then the Duty accord in accordance with the Law of Nature. This is another another duty which we must, we must develop and is another noble truth that we must develop and fulfill. And then the, the results of that duty, the result of that duty, this is yet another noble truth that is to be realized, to be, to be penetrated. So, all of these natures, all these aspects of nature, all this Dhamma that we've talked about, is not something separate than the Four Noble Truths. 
And so understanding Dhamma, understanding nature, will allow us to, to understand the Ariya Satcha, the Noble Truths. Let us repeat this once again because it's of such tremendous value that if we understand these, these four words, then we will have no trouble understanding the Noble Truths and understanding life. There is nature, the natural law, duty in accordance with natural law, and the results in accordance with duty. Just these four words, we should be very careful to remember them and understand them. Nature, law, duty, result. Nature, law, duty, result. Please give these four words your careful attention. These truths of nature, all these meanings or aspects of nature, must be studied, must be learned right here. We can't learn about nature from books, from listening to lectures, from thinking, from philosophy, from speculation, from reasoning. None of these things will <clears throat> allow us to actually know nature in its various manifestations. But if we just study life itself, everything is right there. All we need to know is right there. If we study the body, the body is an aspect, is part of nature. And this body is subject to physical laws, to natural laws. The body is under the power of these various natural laws. And then the body must always act, always has a duty to perform according to those, those laws. And then there will be a result according to that duty, either, either happiness or suffering, pleasure or pain, always arising depending on how the body does its duty. So all four of these can be discovered right here, even in the body, but never in books or in lectures or by reasoning. The Buddha himself said that all the truths we need to know, everything we need to know, can be discovered here in this body and, and nowhere else. All the truths we must know can be found right here in this body. But it must be a, a living body. If the body is dead, well then forget it. You can't learn very much from it. But when the body is alive, when there's life here, then all the truths can be discovered. When we mean alive, that means there is the ability to experience. There's, there's feeling, there's sensation, there's thought, there's perception. With this living body, with, with feeling, experience, perception, thought, in that we can learn every truth that is that we need to know the nature that we must discover in this body it's it's not really different than the nature that's all across the universe but that nature out there we don't really need to to study we just need to study the nature within this body the nature of all the atoms and the clusters of atoms, the various elements that are brought together, compounded together to make up this body. This nature in here is what, what we need to know. The nature all over the universe, it's a little bit too much. 
And then with this body there are there are various actions. There is there are physical actions and movements. There is speech. There is thought, memory, and all kinds of mental processes. All of these all of these are included in the word nature. These are all included in the the truth of nature that we sh that we ought to understand. We like to call it nama and rupa or mind and body. So take a good look at it. In the in nama in mind how many different how many different things and aspects and processes are going on. And in the body in rupa what's how many different things are are happening all of these together are nature are the pure nature of life that is to be to be understood wherever there is nature there is the law of nature right there as well so in this body the body is always under the control under the the power of the law of nature everything the body does is governed by the law of nature and then the nature of the mind is the same the mind everything the mind does all of the mind and its manifestations are governed by the law of nature the body is subject to to physical laws and then the mind to mental laws wherever there is nature there is there is natural law the mind specifically is subject to the the natural law that we call paticca samuppada dependent origination that the mind works like this and like this and like this it doesn't work in div in another way that's how things are that's the law of the mind so anywhere we find nature there we can find also natural law so then there is this this law of nature that things that things must be impermanent if we observe observe the mind for example will discover the law that it all must be impermanent constantly changing unsatisfactory or oppressive and and not self seeing that everything that must must arise through certain conditions and then must cease through the ceasing of conditions this this is the law of nature that we can find everywhere and so in the the law of nature there are two levels the first level is that the law of nature is like this it's not something else it's like this and then the level that things must happen according to the law of nature it's just there's just no other way the law of nature is like this and everything must happen in line or according to the law of nature we need to look as carefully as we can until we see that the law of nature is what the law of nature is like what it exactly what it is like and then further to see that it controls us it forces us to to be like this to for things to happen like this we must look until we see that we're completely under the the power of the law of nature if we look closely enough carefully enough to see this then it is not at all difficult to understand dhamma and when there is this law of nature that that controls us that forces things to be in a certain way or to happen in certain ways then life must respond to that 
Human beings must respond to that, and that response is called duty. In Thai, it's called nati, which translates duty. In India, even way before the Buddha, when people first became intelligent to understand this, this duty of life, they called it Dhamma. So the word Dhamma is very ancient, going back, way back into the beginnings of Indian civilization. They've known this word Dhamma or, or duty. This, this necessary response of, of life, especially of the human being, to the, the power of the law of nature. We can't really say who, who the first human being was that, that came to understand this word duty or dhamma. We don't know who the first person was, but there had to be someone who observed nature very carefully until they realized that there was this duty. So someone somewhere first <clears throat> understood the duty and understood it so well that they saw without this duty, without doing that duty, that we must die. And then since this understanding of duty has been passed along and it's the understanding has developed and grown until the time of the Buddha when the understanding of Dhamma, of duty, was, was taken to its highest level and has, not been, and has not been improved upon since. This understanding of Dhamma, of duty, has been developing with, man, with humanity for a long time. And it's the thing that must be done Otherwise, otherwise, we will die. So Dhamma, duty, is something we have to have. We must have Dhamma in this, in this sense of, of being the duty. If we ask, well then who established or set up or laid down this duty? We can, re we can answer according to the various approaches that we already have. In the theistic religions, then we must say that God established this duty. It was God who laid down the duty. But in Buddhism, we just say that nature, that Dhamma, that nature is what set forth or established this duty. So please don't fall into any arguments or start fighting about who it was that established this duty. We need all of us just to, to study and come to understand this duty. Those who like to say that God is the one who laid down the duty, fine. But we would suggest to you that in saying so, one ought to understand that it's the law of nature that is God, or that what is meant by God here is the law of nature. In Buddhism, this is, this is quite clear, that duty comes from the law of nature, that it's the law of nature that stipulates that if this duty is not done, we die. Without duty, it must die. Without duty, it must die. This is something we can observe anywhere we look. In people, if, the, if there isn't any duty, then, the, then people die. Or in animals, if there isn't duty, then they die. Even in trees, if trees don't perform their duty, 
then they die. Even in the smallest living things, even in a single cell, <clears throat> if that cell doesn't do its duty, it dies. So from the simplest forms of life to the most complex, all life must have duty. Without this duty, life dies. This duty, this Dhamma, is, is absolutely necessary. It's, it's so necessary, there's, there's no even questioning of the fact once we've observed it. <clears throat> Every cell <clears throat> in the body has its duty. And then when the cells gather together into groups, each of these collective groups, or each of these groups has its collective duty. And so when the cells form together and form the blood, the muscles, the bones, all of these have their duty. And if these duties are not performed, then the cells die, the groups of cells die, the, the body dies. These things come together and form hands, feet, ears, and all the parts and organs of the body. And each of these has its duty. If these duties are not done, if these duties don't exist, then the thing dies. And so life in all aspects, on all levels, from the, the basic little parts of the cells, and even the, the little ingredients of the cells, the ribosomes and nucleus and all that, up through the, the groups of cells, and then the organs that are collected together to form a, a living being, a life, all of these must perform their duty. Life must do its duty, or it will die. Without Dhamma, life dies. Life, we cannot survive without Dhamma. Here we can distinguish two aspects, or two levels of duty. There's the physical duty, and there's spiritual duty. For the body and all its parts, there, there is a, they all have their, their physical duty, their physical kind of duty. And then within the mind, in that, in the mind's ability to know the truth, there is the, the spiritual duty. Now some people would also add mental, physical, mental, and spiritual. But really what we call mental, all the mental processes, all the things that psychology studies, all of these are connected with the body, closely associated with the body, concerned with the body. And so what is generally called mental can be included in the physical. But then there's the spiritual, which is distinct. And so there are these two kinds of duty, the physical duty and the spiritual duty. Both of these must be done correctly. If these two kinds of duty are not performed correctly, then the living being dies. So we, have, we need to pay attention to and study these two kinds of duty and learn how to do them correctly. It's, it's quite marvelous that the physical duty never stops. The physical duty duties have to be done constantly, all the time. But when it comes to the mind, the spiritual duty, it's different. Sometimes we can take a rest. Sometimes it, can, it stops. It, some, the spiritual duty doesn't have to be done constantly. But there are these two kinds of duty for us to know, the physical and the spiritual. Something that you've heard about already, that is the Noble Eightfold Path. This, this is the, the spiritual duty. And so we'll discuss this later <coughs> as we discuss the Four Noble Truths.
in Pali, there's another word, samatta. <laughs> what this word means, even if I can spell it, S A M M A T A, with a line over the last A. The other one is spelled differently. This samatha, samatha means da means state of being or state. Samma means correct, appropriate, proper. So this word means the state of being correct, the state of correctness, the state of propriety, of of rightness. Both duties must have this quality of rightness, this this state of being correct, both the physical duty and the spiritual duty must must have this this quality of samatha samatha this state of being correct and then and then life doesn't have to die with these if both duties are right, then there is no death. Now when we say correct or right, we have to ask right according to what? Right in regard to what? We can say that the physical duty must be right according to the things we need to get. Physically, there are things we need. There are legitimate needs. And so it must be correct according to those needs. Or we could, to put it more simply, just it must be right so that there's no death. It's right if we, if, if we don't die. That's the physical duty. The spiritual duty must be right regarding Nibbana. The spiritual duty has to fit with Nibbana, has to be has to be correct in terms of or regarding Nibbana, which is to not die spiritually. There's a physical death and a physical survival, and then there's spiritual death and spiritual survival. To be correct regarding Nibbana is to live spiritually. When businessmen are correct, they get money. When politicians are correct, they get power. And when Buddhists are correct, they get Nibbana. So then ask yourselves, what do you want? So you've come to to study and practice Buddhism. That means you ought to want the thing that Buddhism has to offer. And the only thing that Buddhism has to offer is Nibbana, the quenching of all problems. This word Nibbana is a very difficult one to explain. Many of you have heard it before, either the Pali word Nibbana or the Sanskrit word Nirvana, the same word in different, two different languages. Some of you maybe have even heard that Nibbana or Nirvana means death. Please be very careful and understand this important word correctly. We need to get the correct meaning of Nibbana. We can say that Nibbana is the quenching of everything undesirable, the quenching of everything inappropriate. Literally, the word Nibbana means cool. It's a quenching of heat. When the heat is is 
is quenched the way thirst is quenched with a drink of water. Then there is coolness. We're talking specifically about mental coolness, spiritual coolness. We're not talking about death. Actually, death is in coolness. Death is, is cold. If the body was cool, that's, that's very nice. And so coolness, Nibbana, has nothing to do with death. It's just a quenching of all heat, all problems, spiritually. Then now we can come to the fourth aspect or meaning of, of nature, of Dhamma. And this is the result according to how the duty has been done. The result in line with the way duty has been performed. And the most complete and perfect result is simply Nibbana. The perfect result is perfect Nibbana, the cooling of all problems, all heat, all strife, all suffering within the mind. This is the result that Buddhism is, is offering specifically. However, it's possible to, to speak on, on lower, more mundane levels if we, if we wish. And the, you can use the word result in terms of, of money, Exam for example, when one's economic duty is done properly, or, or physical health, when those duties are done properly, and family, family security, when those duties are done properly, and then happiness, when one does that duty correctly. These, these mundane, these ordinary worldly meanings of result can also be used. But the, the highest meaning of the result according to the doing of duty is Nibbana. When all problems are quenched, when it, the mind has no problems, no heat. We, prob <clears throat> we probably can't use the word grace in, in this context because in Buddhism we talk only about nature. Grace comes from God. But here, using the word result is something that comes straight from nature, out of the law of nature and if the way duty is done according to that law of nature. So we, we're unable to use the word grace here. For the, we can just put God aside for now and see that just if, if the duty is done correctly, the result will happen immediately, naturally. There's, there's no need for, for any grace. And so now we are able to understand the four meanings of the word nature or Dhamma. There's the body of nature, <clears throat> the law of nature, the duty according to the law, and the result according to the duty. All four of these together make up nature. And we can take this to be the ultimate truth or the absolute truth of all nature. So we've used up more than an hour to discuss these meanings of, of nature. Because if we understand nature in these ways, it's quite easy to understand the noble truths. If, if we don't understand nature, if we don't take a good look at nature, it will be very difficult to understand the noble truths 
And most people will, will give up before they actually understand them. So we've taken the time to go to look at nature like this, look at the ultimate truth of nature, because this is an excellent introduction to the noble truths. With this introduction, it should not be difficult for us as we go on to explore the noble truths. So we've used up more than an hour. That is all of today's talk on this, for this introduction. <clears throat> we'll carry on later. And for now, we'll, we'll stop. So thank you for <laughs> listening very well, very carefully, <laughs> and very patiently.